it will be a blessing to you. And so we are going to be looking at a fragment of verse number 1 in chapter 1 of First Peter in just a minute, but we're going to dedicate this series to the Lord and we want to go to Him in prayer. And again, those of you that are watching at home, I hope that you will follow along with us to every uh, step of the way. And uh, we're going to give you some, I think, good background information here in just a few moments. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, again, that you've given to us at this mid part of the week. And thank you, Lord, for the singing of the missionary letter, our time to focus on these in need on the prayer list, and now our time to study the Word of God. And I thank you for everyone that's here tonight and for everyone that's watching at home. We pray, Lord, that you would make this study profitable because we're told in the word that your word will not return void. And so we pray that you would strengthen our walk in this great study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you're looking at the fact check portion of your binder tonight, I want us to start there, but I'm going to read for you a fragment of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. And the portion of Scripture that we're going to read tonight in this passage is Peter. The very first word of the very first verse, and we're going to stop right there just for a few moments. Peter. I want to say thank you, John, for being in our service tonight. Praise the Lord. This brother's been watching our services on Internet forever. And uh, he and I have chatted, and he told me he wanted to come and hear this study. And so we welcome you, brother. Thank you for being in the service. Now, would you welcome him to the Bible study tonight? Thank you, John, for being with us. God bless you, my brother. Now, if you're looking at the first portion of this, the author, no doubt, of this great book is Simon Peter. And we're going to go through some remarkable things about his life and the introduction of this study. And I'm going to read the scriptures that go along with it. And as God brings things to your memory, things that you already know about this incredible man, I hope that you'll take time to make your own footnotes in this study. It'll be a blessing to you to go back and refer to it again at another point. The first thing that I want to highlight tonight is to tell you that Simon Peter was a businessman and he was a fisherman. And for those of you that may have attended the master's class on Sunday morning, Brother Danny has done indeed a masterful job teaching on the life and times of Simon Peter, his approach is a little different than mine because I'm going to be doing an expository study here as we develop it. But I want to focus on some of the highlights of his life. He was a, a businessman and a fisherman, and the Word says in Mark chapter 1, verse 16 and 20, Now, as he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. So the Bible clearly identifies Simon Peter as a fisherman. and That's what he did by trade. In verse number 19, the Bible says, And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And so the author of this book in First Peter is Simon Peter. And now we begin to learn a little bit about his life prior to his writing. The second thing that I want to call to your attention is that Peter became a disciple through the witness of his brother. In John chapter 1, verse number 40 and 42, the Bible says, One of the two which heard John speak 
followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. We have much to say about that in the study as well. The third thing worth mentioning tonight about Simon Peter is that he was given the name Cephas, meaning a stone by the Lord. And we have just read that scripture. That's important to remember as we develop this. Probably one of the most notable things that we remember about Peter, and this is, this is somewhat a shame because I think by human nature, we have a tendency to remember more negative stuff about people than positive. And that's, that's always a travesty. We, we could talk tonight about David. We probably some of the most notable things about him is all the negative things that happened in his life. Maybe we can remember maybe just a handful of clusters of some of the positive things he did. But Peter publicly, we know this, denied the Lord Jesus, but thankfully later he repented. And the scripture for that is Matthew 26, 69. They have these scriptures on the screen and you follow along with us. Now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he did not before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, or them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. That's hard to believe, isn't it? When just a few moments before all of this, he said, Lord, I'm not going to deny you. Though others, maybe John will, not me, Lord. Verse 72, and again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou also art one of them. For thy speech bewayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And we do know that although he did deny the Lord three times, Peter did repent. The word says, and he went out and he wept bitterly. Some of you may not know this, but Peter was chosen to be the missionary to the Jews. The apostle Paul was called to be the missionary to the Gentiles. Peter was the missionary to the Jews. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 and 11 through 12, the word says this. Contrawise, when they set or when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now, when we get to verse number 11, and I'm going to talk about this in another place too, Paul and Peter had somewhat of a conflict with each other. And it was pretty much egged on by Simon Peter himself. And when the word says, but when Peter was come to Ananach, Paul is speaking, he said, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew himself 
he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So momentarily, <clears throat> there was a... You, you ever heard the statement that said something like this, when in Rome, do like the Romans do? In a way, Peter was doing a similar uh, thing as this. And uh, he was trying to... He reverted himself back under the law just a little bit. But Paul, in one case, did the same thing. That's another story another day. But here, Paul was confronting Peter of what Paul was categorizing as hypocrisy. Now, historically, let me give you this. Historically, Peter was crucified upside down by Nero. And the reason why, you've heard that before, the reason why is because Peter pretty much could never really forgive himself for what he did in the denial of Jesus. And so he believed, as crucifixion was a typical way of Roman execution, and Jesus had been crucified between two thieves, Peter never considered himself to be worthy of the type of crucifixion of his Lord. And so he had requested to be crucified upside down, which was granted to him. Now, Peter is writing to people who are hurting and suffering because of their faith. And that's, that's the message that we need to grasp early on in this study. That's how this letter is written. And I will tell you this, this epistle, as it goes forth, because we know that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how it was when the Holy Spirit moved each of these writers, over 40 different writers of the Scriptures, but I don't know how it was when the Holy Spirit came unto them. I can only in my finite vision here of how this went, it takes me back to an Old Testament scripture where Samuel in the early hours of the morning was awakened by the voice of God. You know the story. He was awakened by the voice of God and he really did not know it was at the time. And he goes into to Eli the priest and he says to him, are you calling me? I've heard my name. And Eli says, no, I haven't called you. Go back to bed. You know the story. It goes on three times. And the priest gave Samuel some very good wisdom. He said, son, it's not me that's calling you. But if you hear that voice one more time, and you sit up and you say, speak, Lord. For thy servant heareth. I don't know how it was when the Holy Spirit showed up to all of these different writers of Scripture. I, I don't know the nudge. I cannot tell you how that came to be. But because we do know that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, every word of this Bible, according to Scripture, has been inspired. So I don't know if Peter was just out doing his thing, whether he was preaching, whether... What, whatever it was, whether he was enjoying a day of fishing, I don't know what he was doing. When the Holy Spirit somehow moved him to take up his pen and to write this epistle, I don't know. But when the Spirit of God did move upon him to do this, the thing that I want you to keep in mind is that he is writing to people who are hurting and who are suffering because of their faith. Keep this in mind about Peter as well. It was Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people were saved in a day. And the scripture for that is Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, the next thing I think worthy of making mention about Peter is the fact that he was indeed a married man. 
We don't have too much information in the scripture about all of the other apostles, but I can clearly tell you that Peter was a married man. I've had the opportunity and the privilege, the blessing to take many of you to the Holy Land with me many times. In fact, right before COVID hit, we were scheduling another tour, and we may do that in in the future. I don't know. But in, in Capernaum, there is a Jewish synagogue, the ruins of it anywhere, a place where Jesus did actually preach the foundations, the literal foundation of the synagogue, where he stood, where his feet stood on the pavement is still there today. And right across the street from the synagogue is the ruins of the house of Simon Peter. I have been there many times. I had wanted to, and I still may be able to, take some of the pictures that I have taken in the Holy Land, and as we get to strategical places like this in our study, perhaps get with Justin and those in the back to how to make the, those screenshots for you to let you see this. But uh, it does serve purpose in the study. Peter was a married man where he often cared for his mother-in-law who was not in good health at all. In Matthew chapter 8, verse number 14, the Scripture confirms this. And when Jesus was come, or when, notice that carefully, when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And I have been to this place many times. It would be a blessing to you to see it. Houses back there in those particular days were very small. Very, in fact, Simon Peter's house probably is no wider than this platform. And uh, they they had little stone compartments, so to speak, rooms, and they were very small. Probably the entire house may be uh, a little bit bigger than the width or the length of this platform, but about the, the size, the width of it. Here's something about Peter that uh, we probably remember quite well, and that is that Peter was the only other man who ever walked on water. In Matthew 14, verse 22 through 36, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray and When the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou... Bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So listen, we can remember a lot of negative things about him. And I think it's worth mentioning a lot of great positive things. We we know the negative to the story. He took his eyes off Jesus. The water swallowed him whole. He said, Lord, save me. And the Bible says immediately that's what Jesus did. But here is the thing that I want you to see. Peter was the only one in that bunch on the sea. He was the only one who had enough faith to get out of the boat. I I really believe if John had said in the same breath, yes, me too, Lord, take me, let me come. I believe the Lord would have said, y'all come. But Peter was the only one with the faith enough to get out of the boat. In verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of the Gennesaret. And when the men of the place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment as many touched were made perfectly whole. 
Another incredible thing about this man named Peter is that he had a miraculous escape from prison. Some of these things that I'm mentioning to you are, I think, bringing back fresh memories of the life and times of Simon Peter. In Acts chapter 12, 1 through 19, I'm not going to go through all of those scriptures tonight, but I believe that when you read them, certainly you understand that uh, this was indeed a miraculous deliverance of the Lord Jesus. And so let's go to the next point tonight. Peter was confronted by the Apostle Paul. We've already read that scripture. And uh, he decided that he wasn't going to eat uh, with the Gentiles as the Lord had already gave him permission to do so in Acts chapter 10. We'll talk about that again uh, in the footsteps of this study. But moving on quickly tonight, I want you to see that Peter rebuked Jesus when he spoke of his death. And this was a, a negative aspect of Peter's life to rebuke the Lord, but that's exactly what he did in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Jesus was talking about his death. He said, Absolutely not, Lord. The next one here tonight, Peter wanted to build three tabernacles to honor Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. In Matthew chapter 17, verse number 4, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The next point of reference tonight is that Peter was the disciple who drew his sword and cut off the right ear of Malchus the servant of the high priest in the garden of Gethsemane, John 18.10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. The next one tonight, Peter was given permission to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And I think because this is quite lengthy, I'm not going to read every verse pertaining to this, but the story goes, if you take time to read it at home tonight, Peter was given permission to go into the home of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. Now, I've been to this location many times, the home of Simon the Tanner, where Peter got the vision to take the gospel to the Gentiles, was right uh, on the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea, which is located in Joppa. I have had the opportunity to actually go to the rooftop. Nowadays, we can't take groups uh, to the actual rooftop. We have to stand at the uh, foundation of the home and we show people the house in which this experience took place. But back in the early days when I was able to take people actually on the rooftop, uh, this is where uh, the door, so to speak, the gospel of the Gentiles, uh, to the Gentiles, God gave Peter permission to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And this took place on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner in Joppa, and uh, Peter was visited by three men whom God had given the vision to on that rooftop. A long story short, Peter did go with these men to the home of Cornelius where Cornelius was saved in his household. And so the, the gospel was gloriously uh, shed upon uh, this family. They were gloriously saved. There are 48 verses in that passage, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of those tonight, but it will bless you to read it in your leisure. The next thing, Peter was empowered to perform miracles. And uh, this is in Acts chapter 9, verse 32 through 42. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And then it goes down through verse number 39 to 42, how the Lord had miraculously empowered Peter to perform these great miracles. So these are some great notable things. 
As we come to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1, again, we talk about this first word, the name Peter. I want to emphasize something that out of all of these incredible things that we have taken time to mention, and we're going to mention some more here in just a few moments, you might think, well, this, this guy really here, I mean, he probably went to Sunday school every Sunday. He probably sat on the front row. He probably got involved in youth missions and all kinds of religious aspects. But the truth of the matter is this, Peter was not born in a Christian home. Now, thank God if you were. Some of you here tonight were born into a Christian home. That doesn't make you a Christian, but maybe you had the privilege of being raised in a Christian environment, in a Christian home. Not many people have that privilege, especially in this day and time. When I thought about that, when I was developing this particular point, this thought, I thought about this. Just for a moment, think about sort of like a flash of your life coming before you just for a moment. But think about the many turns in life's road that contributed to the fact that you are now a born-again believer. Think about that. None of us are born Christians. Some of us were born into Christian families. But most and many are not. And so think about all of the twists and turns and ups and downs, mountains and valleys, rivers and deserts that the Lord in his providence and his great grace and his great mercy bestowed upon you to where tonight you're sitting in his house enjoying a Bible study and you have known the Lord for a great amount of time. As we have already said, Peter and his brother made their living on the Galilee. James and John, the son of Zebedee, have been some of his closest friends. Peter had spent most of his years, early years, in a place, a little village called Bethesda. And uh, that's, by the way, that's near the place where Jesus fed the multitudes. But he eventually made his way to Capernaum, which was the headquarters of the hometown of Jesus. And by the way, if, if you have uh, studied something similar to this, you know that Capernaum was in the little village of Naum, but the Galilee. And this is one of the things that I wish I had for you tonight, a picture of the Galilee. You, it would bless your heart. Because the Galilee was a very busy place. This is where Peter made his livelihood. It was alive with boats. And it was alive with fish markets and, and merchants. And they were making fabrics in a nearby village called Magdala, which was the hometown of Mary Magdalene. Roman soldiers were often seen walking through Capernaum by the shores of the Galilee. And so Galilee was a very busy place for many people. This is what I, we're out of time. I cannot believe it. But I want to give you something real quick. I'll expound upon this a little bit more next Wednesday night, Lord willing. You, you want to write this down in your notes that the Sea of Galilee has four different names. So I want to encourage you to write this down. Obviously, it is called the Sea of Galilee. And the scripture for it is Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18. And then in parentheses, you might want to put another location. Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. The Galilee is also called the Lake of Gennesaret. And I want to spell that for you. I want you to get this right. We don't, you don't hardly ever refer to the Lake of Gennesaret. I don't know anybody in here that does. But it's spelled G-E-N-N. E-S-A-R-E-T, Gennesaret. And the passage for that is Luke chapter 5 and verse number 1. I want to give you an Old Testament reference to the Sea of Galilee, and it is called the Sea of Chenereth. The Sea of Chenereth. And when you read Numbers chapter 34, verse 11 and 12, the Sea of Chenereth deals with 
the Sea of Galilee. One more tonight and we'll close. Also the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias. And why are we talking about this? Because this is where Peter made his living. The Sea of Tiberias. I want to give you two scriptures for that. In John chapter 6 and verse number 1. And in John chapter 21, verse number 1. So in the preliminary part of this study tonight, we come to one word, one name, Peter. I want to give you as much background about him as we possibly can. And we have some other things worth mentioning next Wednesday night, Lord willing. All right, so we're off to a good start. I hope you've taken some notes already into the addition to the ones that I gave you. This is a Bible study, and I hope that you'll enjoy studying the Word of God. I'm convinced that many, most tonight, did not have the other three names of the Galilee. It's significant when you read these other passages. You come across, what is that? I've helped you with it a little bit tonight. Well, let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer.